Ed here, back with the continuing story of the DIY turret lathe. This week, we'll be making the actual turret, machining and 3D printing some brackets for the lead screws, and we'll get started on the electronics, hardware, and Arduino code required to get this thing moving. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. Card here to the previous installment of this lathe build, as well as the current F3D file. Starting off with the heart of this machine, which is the three position turret. Mounted in these three positions will be a quarter inch drill, a plunger mechanism, which will press in quarter inch ball bearings to make the plugs magnetic, and a quarter inch rod, which will act as a support arm during the parting op. This, combined with the right parting tool geometry, should allow us to part off the finished plugs very cleanly without leaving behind any sort of pip. First, we'll face the top of the part with the Superfly at 2500 RPM and 8 thou feed per tooth. Then rough out the bulk of the part with the Shear Hog at this machine's maximum RPM of 7500 and 10 thou feed per tooth. And under the Passes tab, we're running an optimal load of 150 thou and a maximum roughing step down of 230 thou. Next up, spotting with a two flute quarter inch drill mill. Some of you may have noticed that I typically run a chip breaking cycle when I'm spotting with this tool, and then I found that this helps keep the straight flutes at the end clear of stuck chips. Pre-drilling with a 1764th drill. Our standard drilling recipe for aluminum is 150 surface feet per minute and 5 thou feed per rev. I like to turn up the coolant a little bit when I'm drilling compared to other ops just to keep chip welding to a minimum. Once that's done, we'll come in with a 2D adaptive and open up this bore using a quarter inch three flute variable flute end mill from Lakeshore Carbide. Max RPM at 7500 and 2.5 thou per tooth. Optimal load at 50 thou and maximum roughing step down of 375. Then another adaptive, same speeds and feeds, only this time 3D so we can take advantage of rest machining and clean up these three corners that the shear hog couldn't quite get all the way into. Now we'll finish off the contours with a 2D contour. Same tool, still at 7500 RPM, only this time we'll slow it down to one and a half thou feed per tooth for a better surface finish. And lastly for this op, we'll break the edges with a 3 8 four flute chamfer mill from Lakeshore Carbide, max RPM and two thou feed per tooth. For op 2, I'm using our new modular soft jaw system for the mod vise. Same speeds and feeds as earlier, only this time I went with both ways adaptive for the roughing because the open pocket geometry lends itself really well to that. These three holes will be tapped quarter 20 for grub screws to hold the tools securely in the turret.
holding the part vertically in the same vise to drill the quarter inch mounting holes for these tools, I decided rather than drill separate holes on the long faces of the turret, we could just drill on through with a number 7 and tap those quarter 20 for the grub screws that hold the turret to its shaft. I probably could have saved a minute or so by throwing a vice stop on here rather than reindicating X every time, but not the end of the world. Next up is what I'm calling the L bracket. This goes between the X cross slide plate and the X ball nut housing. Using a full depth, pretty aggressive both ways adaptive to rough this out. And you can see on the conventional passes, it tends to chip weld and smear a bit if you don't have sufficient coolant flow. If you aren't using flood coolant, the double-headed fog buster setup I'm using here helps out a lot in making sure that you have good coolant coverage from all directions. Speeds and feeds for this are 7500 RPM, 8 thou per tooth, and on the passes tab we have an optimal load of 0.15 on the climb cut and 0.1275 on the conventional cut with a maximum roughing step down of 0.4 inches. Like I said, full depth, trying to make use of every bit of sharp carbide they give you on that insert. Pre-drilling these two holes with a number 7 drill, and then opening them up into slots with a 3 16 2 flute end mill from Lakeshore Carbide. These being slots will help out a lot down the road with the ball screw alignment process. Standard tools and recipes for the rest of the part.
we decided 3D printing would be a good option for the X Ballnut housing. So we did that overnight on the Mark Forged card here for our video going over and reviewing this printer's features. Now on to some assembly, starting with the tailstock plate and turret. Off camera, I've pressed in this 3 8 bore oilite bushing for the turret shaft. And here you can see how I mentioned earlier that the grub screws for the turret are hidden at the bottom of the quarter inch tool holes. And this spring washer between the turret and the bushing keeps the turret from freewheeling as it's cycled. It still turns very smoothly and easily, it just doesn't have any kind of extra momentum once it disengages from the ratchet balls. The Z-axis precision and backlash requirements on this lathe in particular are practically non-existent, so we just went with a plain old high helix lead screw in this case and made the nut free floating in its housing to allow for any misalignment between the lead screw and the tailstock carriage. Here you can see why those slotted holes in the L-bracket were a good idea. The electronic brains for this machine are an Arduino Nano and two TIC 500 stepper control boards from Pololu. The libraries for these TIC boards make programming a walk in the park, as you'll see once we get to the code. And they have direct outputs for step and direction, so you can still use them for things like clear paths even though you don't really need the driver. What they're not good for is anything involving complex synchronization between multiple axes, cutting circles and arcs, stuff like that but for what we're doing here, they're just right. All right, the trick to figuring out the wiring on a four wire stepper, if you either don't have documentation or like yours truly can't be bothered to look it up, just start shorting out random pairs of wires while spinning the shaft until you feel some resistance. When you do, that pair of wires is one phase of the motor and the remaining pair of wires is the other phase. The wires for each phase need to be next to each other when wired to the driver. Beyond that, order of the wires doesn't matter at all. It'll just change the direction of the motor, which can be corrected later in code. Now onto the Arduino code. Uh, we still have some final tweaks to make at the end once the machine is totally finished, but there's enough here to get the thing moving and show you guys what we're doing. First up, since the TIC 500 controllers communicate with the Arduino over the I squared C bus, we have to set them to different I squared C addresses. We want to be able to rehome the machine after a certain amount of cycles. So this variable keeps track of completed cycles and this variable is where we set how many cycles between rehomings. Here we initialize pin 10 on the Arduino as an output. This is used to enable and disable the clear path. And here we set the initial position of both the stepper and the clear path to zero. And in the future, once we figure out the homing on this machine, we'll have reference home functions here. Then we write that pin 10 high to enable the clear path and wait one second just to make sure all this has time to finish up before moving on to the main loop. I have the main loop organized as functions to keep it clean looking and easy to follow for you guys. I think these pretty well speak for themselves at this point, but drill the hole, press the metal insert into that hole, insert the tailstock support bar, forming operation, parting operation, and then withdraw the support bar and index the turret for the next cycle. Here we increment the cycle counter and this if statement keeps track of if cycle count is greater than or equal to reset count, then here it will perform that periodic rehoming and reset the cycle count to zero. Below that we have these actual motion functions, setting either the clear path or stepper tick to a target position, giving it some time to reach that position and do its thing, then returning to the home position and delaying again before performing the next function. And out at the bottom we just have more tick housekeeping and that's all there is to it. Stay tuned for the next installment in which we will tackle the tool holders for the form tool and the parting tool, 
Lots of challenging small parts there for us to machine. And in the episode thereafter, we'll wrap up construction of the actual lathe with the spindle and at long last show the machine making some plugs. That's it for this week, guys. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching.